All right, we are live. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lou Perez podcast. I'm your host, Lou Perez, and I am very happy to be joined tonight by a good friend of mine, uh, James Harrigan. He's a co-host of the great podcast, Words and Numbers, and you can read his work over at AIER. James, thank you for joining me here. Hey, Lou, it's good, good to see you again. It's been too long. And uh, for for those people who are, who are joining us right now a little earlier, um, I just want to put into perspective for them what James is sacrificing in order to have this conversation with me right now. You, uh, if you're watching this, you can see that he's indoors. And before indoors. we started, he was outdoors. And outdoors, he was about to enjoy an, a delicious cigar. But the connection... I had, in, I had it in my fingers with the lighter in my hand you bastard. Re we were ready to go. Yeah. And, th and then the Wi-Fi said, no, James, you're going to go inside and, and you're going to not light that up. And I just, I just finished dinner. It was a gorgeous eight ounce burger with a stack of fries that would make you weep. And, you know, look, there's nothing so good as a cigar after dinner. It's just one of those things. And you took that away from me because of your requirement of a good connection. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a thing. It's a blessing of technology, but then it's also yeah. just the... You know, and then it's not. And then it's not at all. What, uh, how long have you been smoking cigars? Oh, God, uh, 30 years, Wow, give or take. I mean, on and off before that, of course, you know, one here, one there. Um, but very seriously for 30 or so years. What uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a humidor in my house that's so big that it would fit four of me in it. Wow, that's a lot of uh, a lot yeah, of no, snogies I mean, right there. I'm I mean business. I've got more cigars in my house than most of the tobacconists in in Tucson, Arizona, where I live. How'd you get into it? How'd you get into the? I you know I'd be damned if I can remember. Uh, but one day I realized that I loved them, and um, a couple of days later there were hundreds of cigars everywhere. And it's just been like this ever since. You know, you you learn to. Um, to buy these things in cheap, uh, in bulk on the cheap. And, you know, cause you walk into a cigar shop and you, you think, well, $14 for a cigar, that's a little crazy. And I wouldn't pay that right for this stuff at my house, but yeah, somewhere between three and $4, there's a sweet spot if you're buying in bulk. So I have thousands of cigars at my house now. Well, for anytime I hear about cigars, I always associate it with, um, I guess, you know, Cuban cigars. Um, sure. And sure. For, are, for are they, fruit. yeah, yeah. Are they the top, top of the food chain, top of the line? Or? No, and no, and they haven't been for a long time. And, and for all kinds of obvious reasons that if you just sit and think about it for a minute, of course, what I'm about to say is correct. Um, Cubans, uh, just as is the case with every socialist slash communist economy, they're, they're not terribly concerned with quality control, right? How many great products emerge from communist countries? Right. And the correct answer is approaching zero. Now, with, with the Cubans, the cigars are, were fantastic, best in the world, I think, for quite a long time. And their coffee, uh, quite good, too. And, and what you find out is that Cuban soil has no magnesium in it, which hmm. is kind of odd for growing soil, right? So the things that grow there, just have a different flavor. And I, do I like the flavor of Cuban cigars? Yeah, absolutely I do. But they're incredibly expensive and you'll pay 20, 30 bucks a piece for these things. And then they don't burn correctly or you find a feather inside of one, right? It's this kind of nonsense because communist quality control is exactly as bad as you think it is, which is why you don't drive a Cuban automobile right? Or any other, you don't have Cuban appliances in your house. The thought of it is insane, right? Of course you don't. Um, so I, I gravitate towards Nicaraguans, which are generally quite well constructed. And uh, the Nicaraguan soil is volcanic. And it, and that imparts its own flavor profile to, to Nicaraguan cigars. And I far prefer it. I think it's stronger. It's more interesting. So I, I just end up at Nicaraguans time after time. So if there are Nicaraguan cigar companies out there looking for an American shill, you give me a call. There we go. You got James Harrigan, right? Uh, you give me right a call. You. you know, I've, I, I, I've never gotten into uh, cigars. I, um, my dad, I remember when we were, when we were growing up, I think I was in middle school or high school. And uh, I had a bunch of my friends over for new year's 
And my dad being a, uh, you know, a, a generous, cool dad, he opened up a box of, I, I, th I don't know if they were, um, I think they were Romeo and Juliet. Is that what they are? Which I think are like, uh, I don't know if they're Dominicans or, or cigars. Um, and I remember like uh, my, my one friend, Mike, uh, he cut off the tip but he cut off like the tip plus like two inches of the cigar. <laughs> and my dad was just like, he, he, he just like kind of, it was like, he, he just cut off like $20 of, of Yeah, uh, there's, of there's nothing to... worse than non-smokers come over and they say, can I try a cigar? And I'm only too happy to say yes. Then they take two or three puffs and I don't like it and put it down and walk away. I want to slap everybody when they do things like this. Now imagine it's a child, James. Yeah, like, that's okay. It's still one. I'd still want to slap a child, although you're not you're not allowed to give. I mean, it, it raises an interesting question, which is worse, slapping a child or giving a child tobacco? I think slapping. I think. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm well, I that. also think slapping, but I think in the broader society, they might go with tobacco. They might. They might. They well, might. well, I guess. Well, it, well it, here's here's the deal. I'll bring some down to Freedom Fest and, and you and I can smoke together. Nice, nice. There yeah. will be no, there will be no secondhand slapping, uh, yeah, involved. There might be. There, 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 there might be. I don't. Know. I'm a violent. I have a violent soul. You <laughs> well, never well, know what might happen. Well, you know what? You know, you know what concerns me about cigars. It's it's nothing like you know health or anything like that. It's I feel like in order to really appreciate them, you have to have tried a lot and like almost right. it almost like exercise. You know, you have to like That's get right. you know get used to it because. I have, I have buddies of mine who absolutely love whiskey and I just can't do it. Like I just, I, I, I've never got into whiskey and I feel bad, like even taking a sip because I know that mm -hmm. there's somebody else on this planet who they would like nothing more than this, like smoky, boggy, whatever that, you know, whatever you, you want to describe. Yeah. So I feel like I'm, I'm like taking away from somebody who would really be enjoying it. I, I kind of, I'm, I'm with you on that. And, and I don't like whiskey and I don't like wine. And I, I understand people who do, and it seems very similar to my love of cigars and, and also pipe tobacco for that matter. I smoke pipes as well. And, you know, if you hand me a cigar, I can kind of within a couple of puffs tell you exactly where it came from, probably who made it, maybe even the name of the man who blended it, right? These sorts of things. And that probably sounds ridiculous until you think about what any of your wine loving friends do with wine. Right. Exactly the same thing. And, and, and I really do wish that I loved wine and whiskey the way, I, the way that they do. I, they seem to get so much enjoyment from it. And for me, it's, it's zero. I hate this stuff. I, I don't get it. I, I don't get what they see in it. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't that into wine. Um, but then probably like four years ago, no, five, four or five years ago, a buddy of mine got married outside of Florence, Italy, and they had the wedding um on a farm so it was like an organic farm where they had all their own wine and it was just the most delicious stuff i've ever had and it's one it, it's sort of it's sort of the other side of what i was talking about was like when you've had just incredibly delicious wine and now i've never been able to get it again you know it's sort yeah. of like wine just doesn't you know it's just not the it's just not the same I've tried and tried and tried, and I just can't get a taste for it. So I drink my Coke Zero, we'll call it good, and we just move on. There's I'm a, a Philistine. I'm a, I'm a fucking Philistine, so it goes. We'll talk about, you know, quality you control. Do? That Coke Zero is the same Coke Zero no matter what. So. That, that's right. And if the nice people at Coca-Cola would like to be in touch, you're noticing a theme here. I'm yeah, looking for yeah. sponsors, right? We could. That's all we do. Right I literally, I want to be a corporate shill. That's my goal in life. You got to become an influencer. You got to get on Instagram and, and influence. That's, I guess, how they. I mean, um, people how they inside it. my own house don't care what I do. Why would people anywhere else? <laughs> <care>? <laughs> well, well, it's funny. Today, I actually, I had a. Um, a, a very short video of mine is blowing up on Instagram. Um, and by blowing up, it has like, I think like over 150,000 views and people hey are, now. people are commenting and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what horrible thing did you say to get everybody all worked up to watch? Let's, your video? See. Let's see. What did I say? I said, the only people 
who are allowed to say the N word are black people and racists. If you're not black or you're not a racist, you're not allowed to say the word. That's their word. So uh, that has uh, <laughs> that has created a, a dust storm. Um, I don't know if I should even comment on that. It's so no, 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 no. Keep no, yeah, keep that to yourself. Especially if you have a, you have, you have a shaved head. Yeah, yeah, you have that's a right. Head, James. Not well, you know, there was a time when I when I lived in Utah for the first time, which would have been from ninety nine to two thousand. I uh, I was bored one day because let's face it, there's not a lot to do in northern Utah, and I decided to go to the gun show down in Salt Lake City. And, you know, what could be more fun than guns and Mormons all wrapped up together like that? <laughs> and I walked in and some bald guy walked up to me without missing a beat and did the following. Brother. Wow. And I said, oh, check, please. No, no. You misunderstand my baldness. You misunderstand. Right. Um, and and th there has always been, or at least back then there was, back early when white guys weren't shaving their heads so much, right? When before Bruce Willis came and made it safe for all of us. Um, I shaved my head in 1997, male pattern baldness being what it was. That was a fight I was never going to win. So I decided not to play. And it was me, Telly Savalas and Yul Brenner kind of hanging out. <laughs> and when, when I would walk into a restaurant, say the room would occasionally go silent. I was um, that weird. It was that odd. But year, some years later, it got better. But in 1999, it didn't get better, at least not at the gun show that afternoon. That was probably one of the most awkward encounters I've ever had. I actually looked at the guy and said, nope, not brothers. Not brothers. James, you broke that neo-Nazi's heart. You know, he I kind of did. He was it, it, it was because he, he's probably a shy neo-Nazi. He didn't know anybody at the gun show. It was he's deflating. Like, he could you could see his shoulders slump in a little bit. And you, you could tell that it was it was bothering him. I don't know that it was heartbreaking. I hope it was. It would be nice if I could break at least one person's heart in this lifetime. Um, yeah. What can you do? Yeah, I used to I, I had I, a I had a bit. um uh, years back that I was working on, I, I kind of abandoned it for a little bit. And um, I remember seeing a, um, this documentary on HBO about neo-Nazis um, in the, in the nineties. And I thought that was a great documentary. Actually. I watched we, we probably, yeah, we, we probably seen it. And um, in the doc there, they highlight a couple of bands um, that are like, you know, these, you know, neo-Nazi white power, uh, hardcore thrash bands. metal, al yeah, always yeah. thrash metal, right? Always. Yeah. And, you know, I'd seen this documentary like maybe once and like years and years later, I still had some of the songs in my head. And I'm like, hmm. what does it say about me? Like where, like, are these songs catchy? Are they well-written songs, even though the material of them are absolutely disgusting? It's like, you know, uh, so I was just imagining like what it was like, you know, to be in a neo-Nazi hardcore punk band uh, like what brings you to it is it the hate or the love of music like is there a guy there who's like he just he just really wants to play the bass and he's like this is the only band that you know that's that's around <laughs> <laughs> got to get a gig right you got to do something yeah he's like yeah no, i don't know no it's wedding a little bands. weird that you uh it's a little weird that you like this you could be the only perez at the white power rally it could be. Although nowadays, I mean, there was, Not there a lot. was a, it, it's, it's wild. Like, um, I don't know if like diversity has gone so wild that, you know, even like you have Hispanics, uh, you know, claiming to be neo-Nazis and stuff. It's scary times uh, that we live in. Um, of all the in things short. in the world, I'll never understand. That's going to be quite near the top of the list. That's really <laughs> quite awful. It is pretty. What awful. the fuck is wrong with everybody? What the fuck is wrong with everybody? Come on. Actually, I, I want to title that title that uh, this episode. What the fuck is wrong with um, with everybody? Um, well, well, one thing. Uh, please, so, please do. Yeah, you're wearing you're wearing a shirt. Uh, it says uh, JMS on it, uh, which is uh, short for, I, for 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 James. Uh, had it had I am, said there was a little am, story behind this. Uh, this one. There is. It, uh, when I was, uh, I, I worked for a time in Iraq as the dean of the American University of Iraq. And uh, 
I was in charge of all academic and non-academic disciplines. So you could imagine what kind of interesting life I had there. And, and one day this, uh, they, they couldn't pronounce, I, I was living uh, with and among the Kurds in Northern Iraq, and they couldn't pronounce any word that ended in ES. So books became book as, drugs became drug as, and James became James. And this, this little girl in the English language department, so she, was, she could barely speak English yet. She was still learning to speak English, walked in to my office and she said, is the James here? I, I, have, I have been sent to see the James. <laughs> and from that, point, from that point forward, I became the James, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. And it is, uh, we dropped the article, and I'm, but I'm still known as James among my friends. So every now and then I put, I put the shirt on. Nice. How, um, what, years, what years were you in Iraq? I was there from 2010 to 2011. So the interesting thing that happened when I was there was the Arab Spring, which caused exactly as many problems as you can imagine. Yeah. What, um, how did, how did you, did you not know, did you not know this about me? No, I no, I no idea. Yeah, this, it looks like it, it looks like it's taken you by surprise. Yeah. Well, especially the years that you said you were there, Mike. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's like, all right. It was, um, it was, when was that invasion? It was, okay. it, it, I, it was fun. It was the best job I'll ever have because um, I got to be a total cowboy. Just whatever I wanted to do that day, we would do. Uh, but it was a very difficult place to live, you know, very, very lonesome. Family stayed home. I was there by myself. And you don't have a lot of friends when you're uh, when you're a dean. Nobody wants to be your friend because, you know. There's nothing but trouble at the end of that road. So people would rather not. Yeah, I think in, in popular culture, deans have definitely been uh, given a bad rap, whether it's Animal House or uh, yeah, uh, Old Dean School. Obama. Yeah, and now imagine well, you in, in Iraq with the Kurds, you know, the Jameis. Um, the Jameis. Uh, the, being dean there is not the same. It, it, here... It's largely an administrative post that you're, you know, the, the faculty whip you and whip you and whip you. There, it's, I was probably as famous as a small town mayor, like Milwaukee, not New York City, but, but Milwaukee. Um, it's, a, it's a prominent position there. Um, whenever I got into any kind of scuff in, in town, I would hand my business card over and people would just put their hands up and send me on my way. So how'd you get into it? How did that come about? I, uh, I I hated my life the way you do when you hit middle age. I needed something different. Um, a friend of mine sent me an email saying, look, this is probably more different than you want, but eh, give it a look. And it was a job for a professorship in, the, in, in Iraq, in the Middle East. And I thought, no, this is exactly as weird as I want it to be. This is exactly right. And uh, I applied for it and never heard back. I applied to a man whose house I'm sitting in right now, John Agresto, uh, former president of the American University of Iraq. We're still the, the best of friends. And uh, one day I got an email saying, uh, okay, I've changed my mind. Maybe we can use you. Uh, can you can you meet with me? And, and we met. And one idiotic thing led to another. I got hired as a professor promoted to assistant dean, promoted to dean before I got there, which was fascinating. But okay, why not? I'll take promotions better than the, better than the alternative. And when, then I became dean. Yeah, when you, when you, uh, with, the, with the, the geographical location, um, I wonder, was there any, like, death involved in you, you know, sort of climbing uh, up the ladder or... Well, well, no, um, but there was a death threat, um, not against the previous dean exactly, but against her eight-year-old daughter. It was unpleasant. And, um, you know, she obviously wanted to get the hell out of there. And, I, you know, mid, the mid, middle-age crisis, you'd do anything. What the hell? Who cares? <laughs> Shoot you, at me if you want. I don't, I don't care. Did you have an earring at the time? Because I think that I did that's not. One of the steps. Although, 
I have in the past, believe it or not, uh, back when I was a young Harrigan, at the age of 18 or so, I pierced my own ear one night in a vodka induced rage and kept that <laughs> for a while. But the, the hole has, has a last closed and we don't do that anymore. I would like, it'd be nice to look like Mr. Clean. Yeah, no, for sure. But I can't, He's... you know, I'm not, I'm not pushing another stud through a half, a half sealed hole. That would hurt. You can make whatever joke you want now. <laughs> I, I, it appears, it occurs to me that I've really teed one up here for you. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> instead of going for the low-hanging fruit i want to talk about yeah i want to talk about uh, iraq some more so uh sure. the the students uh, are all the students a local or are they coming from all over the middle east um to, oh no they, they they were they were iraqis and and almost entirely kurdish um so we were in a town called sulamania which was about 10 12 miles due west of the iranian border um it would take me uh, about three hours to fly to Istanbul to give you a, a rough geographic mm -hmm. idea. It's about 180 miles dead north of Baghdad. Um, and Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan is, uh, boy, they called it semi-autonomous, but it was nearly autonomous when, when viewed in the context of a larger Iraq. And 85% of our students were Kurds. 15 or so percent were Arabs. And then there was a rounding error of, of students, a smattering that were, you know, Turkmen and, and various odd things that you've never heard of. Um, but it's, you know, the Kurd-Arab divide that's so interesting in that part of the world. And, and when Saddam Hussein was in charge of Iraq, you know, he had engaged in genocidal behavior toward the Kurds. And the Kurds, of course, have never forgotten that, nor will they. The Arabs who were there um, worked with the claim that they weren't actually responsible for that. I'm sympathetic to that point of view as well. But, you know, when you look at the two groups together, you know there's going to be friction, to say the least. And the um, that friction pr provided the stuff of my day-to-day -day job most days. There was, you know, there was dealing with that. There was dealing with uh, external threats, um, uh, which were many. There was dealing with the, the American faculty who didn't exactly take care of themselves as they should. Um, and all, all kinds of in, intermediate problems around that constellation. So to, to put it in perspective, the first thing I would do every day as dean there when I arrived on campus was go get, get my security briefing, mm. right? This is, that's something no American dean would ever say. And and thank thank God, right? Of course, right. they don't have to deal with that nonsense. Um, but that, that's how every day began. And then we would see, right? I would always have a plan for the day. And, 40% of the time, what I was planning on was something we could get to. But 60% of the time, there was a fire significant enough that we would have to just go deal with that instead. Wow. It was and the best job I'll ever have. I mean, it was fascinating. It was foreign. It was unique, right? It, there was something new. Ever. I don't like living the same day twice. So it was always something different, always something unexpected. And it was it was wonderful. Um I'll never have a job that good again, but living there was so hard. I could imagine. And, and what were, you know, what were, what were the students? How, how were you viewed, you know, being a, an American? And, uh... Well, um, it was dicey. Uh, mm. Being an American in Iraqi Kurdistan was actually very easy. They, they, they told me when I was interviewed that not only would I never be threatened, I would likely never be insulted. And that was generally true. Um, although I was, I was threatened, I think, semi-repeatedly. Uh, do you take that seriously? Not as much as you would think. You brush most of it off. Um, if you, if you, when I went into town, it was a little shocking, striking. Um, there was a day early when all of my light bulbs went out, right? All at once, every light bulb in my apartment went out. And I went on this odyssey in town trying to find light bulbs, which was really fucking hard. And I, I'm going everywhere looking for light bulbs. I'm at the bazaar and I'm down one. A. I looked for light bulbs like three hours. And finally, the bazaar, which is like this labyrinth right out of a right out of an Indiana Jones movie. Um, mm. It became my favorite place in town. I, I found light bulb alley where every store only sold light bulbs. And I walked into a light bulb store and the guy looked at me and I, I pointed at the light bulbs and 
and he cocked his head and he realized I was American and he started to weep. And I thought, Oh God, Oh God, I have to get out of here. What horrible thing is going to happen next? And he grabbed a picture of George W. Bush off the wall, eight by 10 framed on his wall, came over to me, pointed to it, showed me a picture of his family from his wallet and hugged me. Wow. And then would not take my money when I went to buy the light bulbs. Wouldn't, wouldn't do it. And, and, you know, look, light bulbs free me was like, two dollars what do i care for him that's a lot of money the average person there the average middle class person was making about three hundred dollars a month that was what they made um so you know i'm i'm beyond rich there mm. there's literally nothing in the town i can't afford literally nothing and uh in some places my money was not accepted it was no good and and you realize you become an ambassador for your country pretty quickly and you, you realize that you have to behave differently than maybe you would be inclined to behave. Mm. Um, because what ended up happening there was the no-fly zone. You might have heard those words put together. You're, you're kind yeah. of old enough. And the no-fly zone that went up in Iraq protected exactly these people. That these were the exact people who were all saved by that no-fly zone. So to them, George Bush is a saint. He would receive a hero's welcome. He could go live there the rest of his life and never be bothered. Um, and that's a little hard to understand when you see the American criticisms of, of the Bush regime. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of agree with a lot of them, right? But the simple fact of the matter is, is this, this job that literally changed my life and for the better, without question, um, would never have happened if, the first George Bush didn't invade Iraq, and if the second George Bush didn't involve himself in it, mm. right? Well, why would any American end up in Iraq of all places? There'd be the same 14 people in the Peace Corps ending up in a place like that. Uh, and yet I showed up some years later with a suitcase full of shirts and a book, and, and that was it. And, you know, life changed from that point forward. So, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for a lot of the things and, and people that I had to deal with during that period. Mm. And in libertarian circles where we both run, you often hear, well, the, the Iraq war was, you know, just a disaster. Well, yeah, to some people, to other people, it saved their lives. That's just simply true, right? These things are always more complicated than a slogan would allow. Where did I live? I lived with the Kurds. Where do my sympathies lie? Well, they lie with the Kurds. Of course they do. They were my friends. I lived with them. Um, does that mean the Arabs don't have a point? No, I don't think it means that at all. And I think they do. And I think that story is deeply complicated and, and deeply, deeply problematic on a number of levels. But it's, it's just never as cut and dry as it seems. And yet the most interesting thing that I learned when I was there, if you don't mind, if I keep talking about it. No, please. No, this um, is amazing. I was there for about three weeks or so, and I had to arrive early. I had to get there before, long before the faculty did. So that gave me a little time to wander around town and get my feet underneath me and figure out what the hell was going on. I didn't know what Kurds were when I, when I got there. I didn't know anything about the region. I'm a political philosopher. I study Plato. Right. And, and congratulations. Here's your new job. So I'm wandering around <laughs> and uh, and I realized after three weeks that no matter what you did, you could not export democracy to this place. W why? They don't want it. And you can talk about the wisdom of whether they should want it or not, but that's not the issue. They don't, don't want it. And if they don't want it, you can't force it on. It's just that simple. And why was I able to learn that in three fucking weeks and nobody from any American administration could figure it out in 20 fucking years? How many people had to die to figure out what it took me three weeks to figure out? And I'm, I'm not some kind of international politics genius. I'm just a guy who showed up, looked around and listened. And it was pretty easy. It was an easy discovery. So there it was. And, and it, the thing I walked away with was that, right? If you really want to know what people want, 
here's a crazy idea. Ask them. Mm. They'll tell you. You can learn a lot just by asking questions and listening. It's the listening part that's so hard for politicians. And yet it took me a matter of weeks. Well, how many lives could have been saved? How many dollars didn't have to be wasted? Well, I don't know. But the answer to both of those is a lot. Mm. Politicians, what can you do? And uh, what was it about the Kurds, like or where you were? What what did they want? What kind of governance? Did well, they and want? this and this would be true of Iraqis more generally. This isn't just a Kurdish observation, although most of my observations are primarily driven through that that tunnel. Um, they they perceive the world not as individuals, not the way uh, Americans tend to, not even the way Westerners tend to, and because I, I think the Germans and the French and the Spanish and the Italians they generally fall in that same line. Um, they perceive the world in terms of their clan and in terms of the power relations between and among clans. So who are my people and how do they relate to your people? And these are the primary questions. And, and you don't get um, individual rights-based democracy flowing out of a clan-based society. Mm. You, you're just not going to get it. I'm not saying you're never going to get it. You might in the future if they come to perceive of themselves differently. But this is a matter of self-perception and what that yields in the political space. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like that uh, that guy who uh, came up to you at that uh, gun show in Utah. He has, kind of, kind he of, has kind of, some right? ideas about his clan, yeah. With yeah, a K, and, and if probably, if, yeah. Well, yeah, careful. Uh, if you if you really think about it, right, the asking them to behave the way you think that they should would be akin to them asking you to behave the way they do. Mm. It's incom it's incomprehensible that I would ever view the world this way. I don't know who my clan would even be, but of course I don't. I come from a, a radically pluralistic society in which if we have clans at all, they're the kind we choose, not the kind we're born into. And I, you know, I happen to think that that's great. And I think pluralism is wonderful. I think the more different human types you get in one place, the more interesting and, and beautiful those places become. Um, but that's not the experience of a big chunk of the world. Mm. They're, they're not interested. And the, the more monolithic a, a people are, the more unified, the more, the same they all are the less different they want anybody to be yeah and you went there as a as an educator um so yeah. what what sort of things were you know what kind of coursework were they doing what what were they learning well, and that that was one of the great parts we uh, we called ourselves saint john's on the euphrates and we were giving them a great books program modeled after the curriculum at saint john's college in annapolis and santa fe new mexico mm -hmm. where my friend john agresto the guy whose house i'm sitting in um, was president he was president of saint john's in santa fe and then he went and started delivering a saint john style education to iraqis um i ended up teaching <laughs> belief it or not american government to iraqi kurds and they're like, sorry, professor, but this isn't yeah. for us. Uh, you know. Yeah, no, and I would I would tell them about, you know, pluralism and how that is really the the grounding, the that that foundation of American political life. And they would all say, What is this pluralism? What do you what do you mean? <laughs> well, sit down, we're gonna have to talk about this. And I remember the biggest thing that, that shocked them, and I said a lot of things that shocked them, as you could well imagine. But the thing that shocked them the most. I said, look, at, at my, in my neighborhood where my house is, I have all these neighbors, and I don't know what religion any of them are. I have no idea, and I don't care. They couldn't believe, A, that I didn't know, and B, that I didn't care. And I said, why the hell would I care? And they, they once accused me of being a Christian missionary sent to brainwash them into believing in Jesus. And I laughed, and they said, what? And they were very angry with me that day. And I said, I, I don't know where you're getting your information, guys, but not even a Christian. I, so be angry if you want, but the Buddhist in the room never really cares how angry you are. And, <laughs> and they, they, had, they had to go home and Google that. And they couldn't figure out the hell I was talking about. Like, who but, the man, hell is a Buddha? What, what is a Buddha? Is this Buddhist? And uh, there, there, there were people there who were very clearly Christian missionaries. They, they thought it was mm -hmm. their job 
to go and civilize the, 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 the uncivilized Iraqis. And we did our best to disabuse them of that notion. That was not their job. And we didn't appreciate it when they decided that it was. And those people didn't last long. They filtered right on through. Always a little shocked that they didn't have administrative help in, in what they were trying to accomplish. They yeah. were also, the students were also utterly convinced that I was CIA. They were utterly convinced. Yeah, they, I mean, uh, because how, how, do you, I, how do you not? How do you not think that? In, in their minds, I look like what a CIA agent is supposed to look like. Big, square, tough, right? This is not, we all knew who the CIA agents were in town. They all lived in the same house. And the house stuck out like a sore thumb because <laughs> it was the only house in the entire city. And this was a city of roughly a million people. There was only this one house in the entire city that was bathed in artificial light all night long. <laughs> if you want to know where the CIA is, look for the lit house. That's the one. And the guys who worked there, you know, they would all say, oh, I, I work for the State Department. Okay, great. Um, but they were about 147 pounds, five foot six, anemic, like they hadn't seen the light of the sun in months. This is what they really look like. These are not tough guys. These are not action movie heroes. These are little weasels who lived in the only house in town with the lights on it. I bet. I, bet the, were, I bet the, the man... kids were utterly convinced. They used to say, I'm going to go down to the CIA house and see if you walk in. I'm like, buddy please. I live in an apartment across town. Go hang out there. Um, yeah. So this was my ridiculous life for a while. I loved every minute of it. I, I wonder if, uh, yeah, if part of the, the reason why that, uh, uh, that man gave you that free light bulb is like, he's taking it back to the CIA house. They, uh, well, they maybe. Need, they, you never they know. They, they need, they need the light bulbs, right? They, they need the light bulbs. I actually lived in an apartment that had 24 hour power, which was pretty nice. That was rare. And we had a uh, 24 hour access to water, which was also rare. Wow. That's amazing. I never, never knew this about you. Have you written about it? Have you? Uh... I have, I have not. Yeah. I like talking about it. I don't, I don't know what I would write. I mean, it was, it was such a strange time. So off the beaten path that people like to hear the stories just because they're so damn odd, right? You don't, yeah. you know. Yeah. You would never, yeah, I would never, yeah, I mean, we would never think just at the time, the place, uh, you know, everything um, just uh, come together. It's so wild. Um, have you, uh, so, so you, you were there for a year, then you came back and did you, uh, you know, for, for those uh, who might not be familiar with your work, but, you know, you're a professor, you've worked in academia for, uh, for a while. Did, I, you, I, did, did, yeah. what, did you go to a back to an American college uh, after that? I, did, I, did, I, I didn't. Um, and I oh. found that having this job qualified me to have all kinds of other cool jobs. Mm. Uh, I came back and went to work for a nonprofit and did that for a bit. It was a terrible fit. It didn't work, right? We were wrong for each other all the way to the marrow. And, and that ended. And I, I decided to kind of keep with that. And I kept at the nonprofit stuff eventually starting my own uh, where I worked with Anthony Davies quite a lot. We do a, a high school program that we later affiliated with another nonprofit again. Um, and then I went and joined Strata, which was a nonprofit out in Logan, Utah, did largely dedicated to environmental concerns. I did everything that came through the door that wasn't environmental there. So we had a Templeton grant on entrepreneurship, which I, I oversaw. And, uh, I wrote a, a MOOC and a textbook for American government during my time there. And that, that was pretty cool. Um, Strata functionally shut down. It, it, it became something else and I was on my way. And then I did go back to a university. I went to the University of Arizona where I became the managing director for the Freedom Center there, taught, taught a bit again. Um, and, and from there, I, I went to the American Institute for Economic Research, where I'm the senior editor. So I, I now try to make the words of economists comprehensible to non-economists, which is more of a trick than you might think. No, but it's so, it, it's so important. Um, and you're definitely one and, of my, and I, one of my go-tos. I, I, I urge people to, to, there is a daily email that I, uh, I type out every evening that I try to make <laughs> actually 
kind of amusing and, and maybe entice you into reading our articles. And you can go and sign up for that at AIER.org anytime you like. So come and check out the work that we do. It's worth your time and sign up for the email. I promise to entertain you. There we go. There's Wait, my pitch. I keep giving pitches today. It, Coca-Cola. Like I'm, I'm like we got cigar, c- cigars, cigar, cigars, Nicaraguan cigars, broadly Coca-Cola and AIR. But AIR already pays me. So I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they have the, um, I don't know what kind of experience that would be. The girlfriend experience. I don't know what that, you're on the payroll. Let's not, let, let's not go down that road. We won't, we won't go I'm, down that. <laughs> I'm going to say something that nobody's going to be happy with if we go down that road. Well, um, you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, trying to, you know, take, uh, you know, economic ideas and explain them uh, in a way, not only that, you know, the lay person can, can read, but also that a lay person would understand. Um, is that, is that the future of, of education? Uh, like where, where is education heading? You know, it, it's at least part of it. Right. And, and I, I'm humble enough not to be able to pick, predict the future. I, I know that there are a number of possible futures before us. I'm not at all convinced that I have enough interior knowledge to tell you which one's going to work and, and which one's not. I can tell you that education is being disrupted, and it has been for a while. Now, people predicted that the university would be out of business by now. They were predicting this 10 years ago. Mm. And, you know, you can go back and check my record if you want. I was calling that bullshit 10 years ago. That's a bunch of hot nonsense. Um, but a number of colleges around the margins are, are closing down. And I think that's for the best. If you look at the colleges that tend to have financial trouble right now in the here and now, um, most of them fully deserve what they're getting. They've been giving a lousy product for years. And, you know, when you get a, a disrupted industry, as you're seeing with education, it's not the Yale and the Harvard that, that go first. Right. It's the small Christian colleges in the deep south, things like this. And when you see how a certain class of schools is is faring, I think it's probably for the best. And I would like to see a bunch of bigger schools start to have the same kind of problem. Now, a bunch of the bigger schools are having an identity crisis and they are saying, what can we do to remain relevant? I'm not convinced they're coming up with the right answers, but the they are asking the right questions and, and that's necessary, but insufficient in, in getting on top of the problem that they find themselves in. Now, is this an industry, if I were 20 thinking, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Would I get into higher education right now? I absolutely would not. There's too much uncertainty. It's clearly going a hundred different ways. Unless you've got a clear vision as to how you can fix a problem that's going to have to get fixed, I would say stay away from it with every fiber of your being. And, you know, that's that's the best I can do. What's going to happen? I don't know. Would I bet my life that this is the right thing to do? No, no, I would not. If I wanted to get a PhD in something, it might be economics, it might be finance, right? It would be something much more practical than the typical PhD because I don't know that there's a long-term play at the university level, the same way that there once was. Yeah, my uh, my, my oldest is three, and you know, so we're not thinking about college uh, just yet. But I think my my wife and I have we've we've had enough conversations, um, you know, between us and with others, where we are totally, um, uh, I guess, accepting of a future where you know our boys don't. Go to college, you know. Oh, boys. and why, why wouldn't you be? Right. I can tell you this. I, I can tell you this. Um, if you lined up all the college majors, and there are about four hundred and fifty-ish college majors, and you said, "Okay, what's the lifetime expected earnings of all these majors?" and this doesn't mm-hmm. include any graduate majors whatsoever. So, doctors, lawyers, not included. Only undergraduate majors. Um, on the far left of the graph, you you find. Um, petroleum engineering, which yields a $7 million career. On the far right of the graph, you see uh, child and family services, which yields less than a high school diploma. 
you're wow. actually worth less with that degree than you would have been worth with high school. And what you see is, you know, exactly what you would expect, a, a, a downward slope from very high to very low. And if you take um, auto mechanic, plumber, electrician, and military, and, and ask, okay, how do these guys do? Um, roughly speaking, they do better than two thirds of all college majors. Two thirds. There's no shame in that. You want to be an electrician? You can have a great life. Because what did we do? In the 1970s, we started telling everybody they needed to go to college. Right. By the mid 1980s to the 1990s, everybody was going to college. And when everybody went to college, nobody learned how to be an electrician. And what happens when, when there's a supply and demand problem, price goes up. And now you can make like a hundred grand a year being an electrician. Yeah. Uh, welder also on that list, welder. There's no shame in any of these things. These are well-paying jobs. They're going to pay off way more than the English major or whoever the hell is majoring in medieval lesbian poetry or, you know, the, the goofy ass things that people major in these days. Um, you know, your various grievance studies, nonsense degrees. Mm. I, I would far rather see people major in, or go do these real things that there's a real demand for. Yeah, my, I mean, son I... came into my, my son came into my office. Look, I'm a life, lifetime college professor. My son came into my office a couple, maybe a year and a half ago and said, would you be terribly offended if I didn't go to college? I said, good God, no. Live whatever life you want. Yeah. But did, why would you think you had to do anything? I mean, you best get your ass a job and move out of my house. But a, <laughs> apart from apart from that, eh, not at all. Yeah, and there's uh, there, there's this. Uh, I don't I don't know what this uh, is. It delusion where uh, the idea that if somebody goes and becomes an electrician or a welder, that they are incapable of picking up Shakespeare. Of, yeah, crazy. Of, it's, read it's, a book. Yeah, the, especially especially now. I mean, you know, talking about disruptions and in, in go, education. Go read a book. Get technology. on YouTube. Find a guy who talks about it. Right, there are experts on YouTube on every on every single topic. Go listen to thirty of them for all I care. Right, go go be a full human being. I don't see a single reason why you can't read Plato, no matter what you do for a living. Yeah, I, I don't see a single reason. That would be like telling me I shouldn't play my guitars because I'm not a professional. Right. Why the hell not? I'll play whatever I want, right? And mm -hmm. and I think intellectually, people should take much the same approach. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to think of just when I'm when I go and you know, like meeting new people, like you know, uh, with my wife, and you know, meeting like uh, you know other couples and all that. I I don't. How many times have I asked someone, "Hey, where'd you go to college?" It just. Yeah, I try often, not. I try not. To, I try not to anymore. It it often just just doesn't come up. It's more of, um, I'm more yeah. blown away by like, uh, like our, our one neighbor, he works in, um, uh, in New Jersey with creating power, you know, at like, uh, uh, power plants. I'm really interested in that. And that's actually pretty cool. I would like to hear about that. That's pretty cool. Like he, uh, yeah. he started out, I think working on, uh, they're basically like jet engines, that you know are incorporated into like this power grid. And he was telling me about you know this stuff, and a lot of it just went you know over my head. But I was like, wow, what a what a incredibly interesting you know job that he has. Um, I remember I lived in a town called Oswego, New York. It was on the lake, the on the banks of Lake Ontario, and there's a nuclear plant in town. And it just so happened that the neighbor worked at the the nuclear plant. I would love and to honestly, talk to that guy. Oh my god! Yeah, all I wanted to talk. All I wanted to talk about were um, safety protocols. Tell me what happens when. Yeah. I couldn't wait to hear it. Couldn't wait. And, and, and boy, he had answers for me at the drop of a hat. Yeah. He called, his buddy, he called his buddy in, uh, in Iraq and said, yeah, I think that CIA guy's here. He's yeah, testing yeah, me. Yeah. It, actually, they happened in reverse order. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I went to Oswego first. Um, it was easy. It was better living in Iraq in a lot of ways. Oswego was a terrible place to live. <laughs> I, got, I got there into my new neighborhood, and there was a fire hydrant and a flag like 15 feet high off the, the fire hydrant. I said, what the hell is that? And they said, oh, that's so in the snow. In the snow, they can find the fire hydrant. And I looked 15 feet up and I said, that'll never happen. If that flag was so far under the snow, you couldn't find it by the middle of January. That's unreal. 
lake effect snow. I was out of there as fast as I could get out of there. <laughs> um, on the, you know, uh, on the continue, uh, continuing education and, you know, autodi autodidacticism. Um, what, what, I don't, I don't, yeah, that's a right. good question. Yeah. What are, uh, you know, what are you up to now? What are you, uh, what are you reading? What are you watching? It doesn't have to be, you know, education. Yeah, I've, I've, I've become very, very interested in pop culture. I think this kind of defines the, the area of my fascination lately. And, and I think it's clearly the case that culture drives politics, that politics is downstream from culture. This is one of the groups I work with, the, um, the, the, uh, Center for American Culture and Ideas. Um, it's a group in, in Tucson started by Dan, a composer, Dan Asia, largely dedicated to this principle that, that if you want to do anything politically, well, don't bother and do something culturally instead because that's where any change you could make will be affected. And I, I, I think that's exactly the case. Um, and you start to take a look at culture the way that the composers say would, would would see it or the art historians we work with composers and art historians um but i always want to go a step further and ask about pop culture right because that's what that's what human beings consume and that defines how they live i mean look what they're watching on tv is very likely a lot more important than what happens in congress this week and isn't that fascinating? And nobody really thinks about it in those terms. The music they listen to likely puts a residue in their brain in a way no politician ever could. So what is it that we should be thinking about? Um, you know, and it's movies, TV, music, comic books, even to some degree. And I, I'm, I've been looking at all of these things lately, asking the larger question, how is it that we should live? And, and what impact does pop culture actually have on our political life? And I think th that's likely to define much of what I do the rest of my days. I have a, a friend of mine who says, uh, he says, let's stop calling it pop culture. Just call it culture. Yeah. Because really, it, it is. You know? It is. And, and if you think about it, and the thing that kind of hooks me, Homer is kind of high culture material at this point, right? But those were songs that people sang to entertain each other. Mm -hmm. That was that was around the campfire, right? This wasn't in a hall with people wearing tuxedos in the room. This was just something that everybody listened to. Um, and so on and so on and so on, right? Everything that lasts the test of time, we say, well, yes, that's high culture. But it didn't start that way. Mm. It started as something that people listened to, typically listened to or, or watched, you know, a, a live performance of a play, you know, this sort of thing. It, it gets easier to contemplate these things when television and movies enter the enter the fray. But what we think of as high culture now wasn't necessarily, you know, a lot of classical music was church music and, and, and things like this. But a lot of it was something that appealed simply to a large popular audience. And it lasts because it kept right on appealing to the same audience. Well, here we are. And, and I think you've got a point there. Your, your friend does your unnamed friend that maybe we should just call it culture, but I I'm fine differentiating that, which has lasted forever. That's a good Mozart, point. Yeah. Mozart and that, that which hasn't Taylor Swift Taylor Swift not going to be around for, you know, in 300 years, except as a footnote somewhere to serious music. Um, that said, people said that about the Beatles and the Stones not too terribly long ago. Mm. And they were wrong. They were dead wrong. The Beatles and the Stones will be not pop culture, but capital C culture before long. And, and Taylor Swift, okay, I just dismissed her out of hand as a, a talentless hack. I might be wrong, right? I, I, I said earlier that I'm kind of humble about these things and my opinions are very often incorrect. So this one might well be incorrect. I don't know in a hundred years what music is that's out right now that we'll point back to and say, wow, that was really something. Um, correct answer for those of you out there, Marillion, M-A-R-I-L-L-I-O-N. Go listen, it'll change your life. Wood Shill for Marillion would do it for free. Um, they're that good. It's the sound of God's laughter. 
but that's a boutique taste I've got there. That's English neo-progressive music following in, you know, Yes, Genesis and Pink Floyd's vein. That's not going to be terribly popular. You're not getting millions of people to listen to that. It's a boutique world. We all get to pick and choose exactly what we want now. What's I, cu what's culture moving forward? I don't know. I uh, There's a, a Genesis tribute band called uh, uh, Musical Box. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. But I have seen them not once, but twice <laughs> live perform in its entirety. The lamb lies down on Broadway. Nice. Uh, I, I I like to go see Steve Hackett do the same thing. He he tours through the U.S. every year or two. I go every time. And uh, I I could tell you because I I go with my older brother. My older brother, he's the one who got me into Genesis when I was in middle school. So you got two dudes named Perez listening to old school Genesis. <laughs> well, well, one dude, actually, we we have different dads, so he's a half, Stran half brother. Stranger than fiction. <laughs> it is strange. It is strange. strange. But I got to tell you, I, I when I go, I'm the youngest dude there, and yeah. and you know it's just the you know it's just the reality, and I'm I'm blown away because they do, they have all the costumes, they have all of the the um, projections and all that stuff, so you feel like you're watching this band from Peter the, Gabriel era Genesis was really something, really wild, you know, really wild. Pe stuff. People think that Genesis is a Phil Collins band, but that was a pale shadow of what it once was. Yeah. Well, I, well, and I, I don't think people. It, it it's so amazing that you have this band that had not only Peter Gabriel but also Phil Collins in it. it it's yeah. And then and then you know uh, you know Rutherford and uh, Tony Banks and you know just a, just an incredible. Um, but yeah, I've I've I, I've been there and and you know being in that moment, part of it was very special because uh, I, I love my older brother and. Uh, it's great getting to you know share something like that with them. We've done we've done it twice, um, but also knowing, you know, sort of like, like you said, like a hundred years from now, I don't know how many people are going to be talking about the lamb. Uh, but well, I, I think there's probably going to be some, and yeah. and okay, maybe maybe that's a little out on the fringe. But Dark Side of the Moon has a place at yes. the table. Uh -huh. It just does. There's there's no way that's not correct. Um, and, you know, I, I know I'm wrong about a lot of things. I know I'm not wrong about that. So, okay. I mean, that I think that's fantastic. And and that, that album was made in the early 1970s. I, I still put it on, and it still sounds fresh and new to me somehow. Mm -hmm. it's, re it's remarkable. That's the hallmark of art. And, and here we are. Um, so what's with us long term? I don't know. Whatever it is, it'll be that which people loved. Mm -hmm. So what is it that people love and do they continue to love it long term? Beatles, Stones, Zeppelin, Deep Purple. Yes, 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 and yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Do and, and, and boy, I'm inclined towards purple in that group, which also means Sabbath and all the metal bands, right? And it also means the other, down the other road, uh, down the Beatles Avenue. Well, now you've got Genesis and Floyd and all the melodic music. And before you know it, that rock and roll family tree is just gigantic. And a lot of it is utter garbage. And I think, you know, if you listen to the top 10 right now, I can guarantee you that 10 out of 10 of them are garbage. Do I know what they are? I do not. And yet I know they're going to be trash. And yet there is great music being made now, just as there's been great music made in every other year for for all time and, and go find it right like i said before it's a boutique world you can find whatever the hell you're looking for it's out there and it's actually easy to find now i've got mm. this magic thing called spotify uh, there's another thing i would show for seven million songs at the at the end of my fingertip in whatever i want whenever i want it yes please please give it to me this is the best ten dollars a month i spend on anything because i'm a gigantic music nerd so I don't have to go out and buy CDs anymore. I don't have to go hunting down these crazy things that nobody can find. I just type it into a browser. And there I am. What a beautiful world we live in, Lou. And and deep down inside, everybody knows that's true. Right? Yeah. Everybody knows that we've got it better now than we've ever had it. And that's literally true in every single way you can imagine. We're materially better off in every way you can imagine, which means we have time for leisure. 
which has been the goal of mankind since the Greeks walked the earth over 2,000 years ago. And what do we do with our leisure? We turn into a bunch of pain girls, and all we talk about are our various disorders instead of going out and enjoying the freedom that we have because of our incredible wealth. A poor person in the United States right now is better than an, better off than an 18th century European monarch, better than a divine right king. How do I know that? Look around. You have plumbing inside. The toilet takes things away from where <laughs> you live, and the sink brings water in. Th these are miracles. You have hot and cold air coming in as you wish. You have a magic box that keeps your, your food cold and not killing you. You have another magic box that makes it hot so you can eat it. These are wonders. Um, I was talking about this with my wife just yesterday. Think about the miracle that a washing machine is. Mm. Think about what you don't have to do because you have a washing machine. You don't have to wear dirty clothes for weeks at a time because it's such a pain in the balls to wash them. And then you don't have to put them in a sack and drag them to a place with naturally occurring water. And then you don't have to beat them with rocks, hoping to get all the dirt and stink out of them. No, no, no. You have to walk in, drop them into a basin and press a button. What's the hardest part of washing your clothes now? Folding them when you're done. And people complain about that. What a bunch of pussies. You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. This is how good we this is how good we have it, that we complain about these things. And instead of using the abundant free time that we have, we all want to get to a psychiatrist to get to the bottom of our mental disorders. Please. You know who doesn't want to do that? My friends in Iraq. Mm. They want to have a good enough life so they don't have to worry about getting killed next week. They want to know that there's going to be enough food that their children will be safe. They're not crazy. That's what they want. Why do they want those things? Because those are the best things. And congratulations. If you live in the United States, you have those things. And I got to tell you, as somebody who's broadcasting from the laundry room in his basement, where right now my computer is situated <laughs> right above the washing machine, I'm very grateful. And I'm, and I'm grateful to, uh, to be speaking to a, to a friend. Uh, James, like, like you said, it, it's, it's been a while it's, since we, uh, since we talked and I, I can't wait to see you in person. It's been too long. Yeah. yeah. It's been too long. And I look forward to seeing you too. All right. You could, uh, guys, you could check out, uh, James's stuff, uh, over on AIER. Um, and, uh, and at words and numbers, you go listen to word, describe, uh, subscribe on all your devices. Daddy needs a new pair of shoes, et cetera, et cetera. There you go. And his, uh, his, uh, his co-host, uh, Anthony uh, Davies, is pretty cool, too. So shout out to him. Thanks, yeah, James. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> Take care of yourself. We'll talk to you soon. See you.